what we want to do now is uh, think about this transition right here, where phi is initially not zero. And as I emphasize, this is a valid thing to do, whether or not mod physics is important. Uh, we're at much lower rope, I think. I believe everyone in the field will agree with that. So if you have spin density of order on a setting in a Fermi liquid state, even though it's extremely strongly correlated in a large U state, just on question of symmetry that the important physics near such a transition will happen near these, these hot spots. Uh, and I'll just use these, this as evidence and also the neutron scattering as evidence this, that, that this is what's going on. Okay. All right, so we, you know, we're really trying to add an antiprobagatism coming this way. Okay, so how do we do that? So we write on a theory now. Now really I turn the crank just like I turned the crank for the honeycomb lattice do exactly the same thing. We make phi feel dynamical. Uh, right here, I give it some phi fourth action. Uh, you have your electrons, and then you have this coupling, this Yukawa-like coupling, uh, scattering the electrons by momentum capital K times phi. Okay? This should be second nature to you by now. <laughs> if you, it's exactly what I did in my second lecture for the honeycomb. And at this point on the honeycomb lattice, I got the gross novel model. Uh, here, life is not so forgiving, again, because of the Fermi surface. So, how, so this is still not something, it's not a field theory. Uh, it's not a field theory because of this big capital K here. We don't want big momenta running around in a field theory. Field theory should only have small momenta. So how do we make this a field theory? Uh, and so I'll follow the procedure uh, first made by Abunov and Chubakov, which is they say, well, focus on these, on these, special, these eight special points, uh, which are the hot spots. And I do a gradient expansion about those points. Okay, so, so uh, you know this is exactly again what I did on the honeycomb lattice, where I got Dirac fermions. Here I don't get Dirac fermions. I get something. You know, I, I get Fermi lines, as you'll see, rather than Fermi points. So I, I take these these eight points and expand the electron about those points, uh, and just the free electron Hamiltonian. In fact. Uh, uh, not even this, even if phi equals zero, just the EK becomes this, okay? So these are points in the Fermi surface where the energy is zero. If you move away from them, the energy moves or toggle. It only changes in a distance perpendicular to the Fermi surface. So these V1 and V2 are the vectors perpendicular to the Fermi surface at this point and that point. That's it. So the energy only depends on one direction in K space for each hot spot. Again, very different from a direct fermion, where it depends on mod k. Here, it only depends on one component of k. Uh, so now, I can move this point over to that point. I can alias it by going to go to the low energy limit. And when you do that, uh, this is the picture you're going to get. Okay. Uh, so you have fermions 1, which are moving with velocity v1. It means the dispersion of fermions 1 is the surface coming into the, to the board, intersecting the board on the red line. Okay. So the surface, or actually it's the other way. And here, the, the, you're below the board, so the energies are negative, so the states are occupied. The red fermions are occupied. Here, the red fermions are empty. And the other fermion, the other hot spot, is another surface uh, coming this way. Uh, and, and, in that, uh, and here, the side two are, states are occupied, and there they're empty. So now you see, if you look for the number of occupied bands, these are both spin up and down. Uh, there's one, one, two, zero. Right. And this looks like a direct cone, but it is not a direct cone. This is a direct cone has zero energy at only one point at the center, the circle. This thing has zero energy fermions on this line and on that line. That's what makes it more complicated. But many more low energy states. Uh, so now if I turn on phi, okay, these are the hot spots and the cold lines. If I turn on phi, couples this way. Uh, and whoops, okay, I don't have that picture here. So in this, now, you know, this is the continuum theory. Uh, this is your Yukawa coupling and uh, relativistic, initially relativistic field theory for phi. Uh, and uh, the most important difference is right here because it's got zero, lines of zero energy rather than points of zero energy. Uh, so now if you diagonalize that spectrum, let me go back here. I don't have that picture here, sorry. So I have, uh, I guess, the blue line this way and the red line this way. And 
these are the Fermi surfaces now, okay? This kx and ky. These are lines of zero energy excitations. This is at phi equals zero. And when phi is non-zero, well, they're going to mix, and I'll just use another color, and they mix in the, the obvious way, and what the Fermi surface is, you know, it looks very much like a level repulsion diagram, but it's not a repulsion. It's similar to that, but not quite. Uh, and now you have these, this will be the new Fermi surfaces. And, and roughly speaking, initially, so this, this will become the electron pocket, and that becomes a hole pocket. Okay. Yeah. It doesn't happen in the other region, far from the critical spots. Yeah. So far from the critical spots, not not much changes. I mean, as as usual, you can see that from here. If either of these is large, then a small pi makes no difference. Right. It, it depends on if, if if phi is small compared to any of these numbers, then you can ignore it and you get the old band structure. Uh, all right. So. Many people have spent a large fraction of their lives trying to understand this field theory. We still don't have a complete understanding of it. Uh, safe to say that uh, it, you know, if we try to do a large n expansion where n is the number of components of psi, um, initially you think you can just get away with two loop diagrams, then you realize after this important work of Sunsik that you have to sum all planar graphs. And then if you look at it even further, as my student Max McClitsky looked, you find things are even, even worse than that. Some graphs grow with n. So it's at least as complicated as the most complicated in all of the engaged theories, but yeah, that much we know. What's the bridging between the whole pockets and the uh, Well, that's, that's a state with the, the only one band is full. I mean, sorry, the only, it's, it, that is a gap. So, no, so in this region, you've got one band below the board, which is fully occupied, one band above the board, which is empty. In this region, you've got two bands that are occupied. In this region, you've got no bands that are occupied. Because you have to think of, well, I should have spent some time in mathematical drawing this in three dimensions. There's probably a nice way to draw it, but. Yeah, yeah but can you like have a slide to show us, well, in, 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 both, in three regions? I would love to do it, but I, I don't want to get bogged down. So the easiest way to do this is to take this as your x and y dispersion. So just take x in this direction and that y in that direction. Uh, then your dispersion is basically ek is x plus y over 2 plus or minus square root of x minus y over 2 squared plus y squared. So you have two bands, e1 and 2. Okay, you plot these as a function of x and y, and then you just occupy half of the states. You, you'll, see, you'll see this kind of structure. Right? Uh, I could do it, but it'll take me 15 minutes, so I leave that as an exercise. <laughs> Take that function, put it in Mathematica, do a surface plot as a function of xy, the two functions, and then put your Fermi level somewhere and look at where, the, where it intersects these surfaces. You have two surfaces, you have to figure out where the Fermi level intersects these surfaces, and there's green lines are where it will intersect. So it's like in the lower part, in the electron pocket, like both, both levels are under the Fermi level. Exactly. Here both are under the Fermi level, here both are above the Fermi level, here one is below and one is above. And when the number of occupied bands changes is where you get a Fermi surface. That's the most dangerous region. Yeah. Change the parameters theta and B. Right, okay. The relative scale between the two of them, does that mean anything? Um, yes, yeah, that, that's the velocity. So, okay. Uh, I'd rather, again, not go into this uh, because that's. So, there's a very long, long history behind this. There's the, something called the Hertz theory, which is now known to be incorrect for this case. Uh, and uh, anyway, as I said, this, for a while we thought we could get by solving this theory by solving all planar graphs, and that even now known to be not correct. It's even worse than that. That's about as much as we know about it. Which is, I think, exciting news because even this very simple theory, the, I think, has enough richness in it to, to explain the complicated phenomenology of the two points. Okay. All right, 15 minutes left, so if you forgive me, I'm going to go a little fast just because I don't want to. I want, I want to end my lectures by actually showing this picture. Okay. <laughs> uh, all right, so actually, so how do you get superconductivity? Well, there's uh, the, uh, the picture for this actually remarkably goes back to, I think is a pretty amazing paper by Scalopino et al. 
1986, which is before the discovery of IPC, where they were considering our most beautiful model, the Hubbard model, but they were working in three dimensions. Okay, so <laughs> if they just, you just take their theory and reduce it by one dimension, you get the correct answer. In fact, they predicted uh, dx squared minus spin sigma dx squared minus y squared pairing, which is what C. Uh, okay, and uh, what is the physics of this? So I have to explain BCS theory to you now. Okay, so they, in paraphrasing, they start from this uh, large Fermi surface state before you actually enter the order state and look at the effect of phi fluctuations. So I, I certainly argue that when phi is non-zero, then you get part the Fermi surface breaking apart. But before it actually breaks apart, uh, what you can see also from this field theory I mentioned that you get superconductivity. Uh, and how does this superconductivity arise? Well, I'm sure you all know the BCS paradigm. BCS theory tells us you have electrons. They attract each other because of the electron-phonon coupling. They found a bound state roughly, which is called the Cooper pair. And when that Cooper pair both condenses, you have the Bose-Einstein, I mean, you have this superconductor. Okay. So the, the operative thing here is some, have some mechanism for electrons to attract and pair. And here, their idea is, well, instead of taking the phonon, they're going to take this phi, this phi field that plays such a central role in everything I've discussed. So just exchange a bit of phi and see what you get. Okay. So here's the phi interaction. So now they're going to integrate out phi. Okay. They integrate it out. And just imagine that it has some static, you know, it ignores dynamics. And assume the phi propagator uh, is just 1 over, has these masses, it's 1 over k squared plus m squared. Now there's two complications here. One is, of course, uh, this is, it's not really a mass because we're talking about equal time correlation, so condensed matter physicists like to call it C inverse squared or correlation length squared. So this is some mass for, this is the propagator of phi. And then secondly, the k, this is, of course, very important. The momentum of this is measured relative to capital K. You know, on the lattice scale, I still have to remember these, these oscillations. So if I'm going back to the lattice fermions, then I have to put Q minus K. So this Q is actually a large momentum. It's near capital K. All right. um, so if I just do one loop integrate out phi, this is, this is just you know, the very simplest particle physics diagram. It's just this, this graph. This is phi, C, C. And, and, and the phi propagator is this term right here. So when you do this, um, you get a okay, you, you get an attraction every time you integrate out a boson. Uh, you will get an attraction, uh, which is coupled in this way. So you get a minus sign here, uh, but you also get the spin structure: sigma alpha beta dot sigma gamma delta. So you think, well, that's great. It's a, it's an attraction, so it's going to pair. But you know. You would expect the pairing to happen with opposite spins or electrons. You want the spin single state. If they're opposite spin, then you, the sigma z, sigma z term here will give you another negative sign. And so you'll conclude that this is actually a repulsion between opposite spins, which is also correct, but it's a repulsion only in the S wave channel. It's not, it's an, it turns out to be an attraction in the D wave channel. So, roughly speaking, what does that mean? Uh, uh, what it means is that. Uh, I go to this picture. So take an electron, you know, uh, let's see, uh, and this is a better picture. So this electron at this hot spot is going to pair with the electron at this hot spot. Now phi comes along. Now, phi has momentum capital K. So it's going to scatter this, this electron to that point and this electron to that point. Okay? So that's the initial, so you have a pair, you have a Cooper pair coming along, which is sitting, which is a pair of these two electrons. Okay, so then now I'm going to consider the fall in terms of diagrams. Uh, um, I have the electron coming in, two electrons coming in. They interchange phi, and then they keep going. They interchange phi again. And phi again. So this is so-called, you know, the, I'm solving basically the basis of Peter equation for two particles propagating with exchange of the phi goes on. Uh, 
The only complication is this is momentum k and this moment minus k. This will be momentum k plus capital K and minus k plus k. Assuming this is small momentum, uh, but, but there is a capital K there. By the next time, it will be back to K. Well, K prime, sorry. These will be different Ks. OK. All right, so now in the old BCS theory, there was no capital K. And, and you roughly ignore the momentum dependence of this interaction, some, some local attraction, and, and you got s wave pairing. Now, if you look at this theory between opposite spin, you initially see a repulsion. But then you notice that suppose the, the, uh, the pair of the wave function, you see that there's a pair here, the pair wave function is positive here and negative here and positive here and negative there. Suppose it's flipping sign. Then you're going to get a net attraction. So that's the physics of the D wave pairing uh, that go back to this picture. The pair wave function, the wave function of this pair, you know, if it's positive in this region, when you change the momentum by capital K, so this pair has a positive wave function. When you change it by capital K, you get a negative wave function, or the other way around. So if you change, take the pair wave function to have this, this to be zero along the diagonals and change sign in this D wave manner, that's the x squared minus y squared form, you will get a net attraction. And this, this that's the content then of this paper. Paraphrase, they were working in a more complicated geometry actually in three dimensions. Um, okay, so right, and here's this picture. You have a pair propagating. You have a, a exchange of phi, and when you exchange a phi in this picture, this pair converts to that pair, and then back and forth. So that's that's what's happening. And each time you convert back and forth, you pick up a minus sign. And that's the minus sign of D-wave pair. All right, so and. Amazingly, you know, there's been this new set of compounds called the nictides that have been discovered in the last, uh, last year, I think, yeah, year and a half, uh, which are you know, not mod insulators, but they have many other similarities to the cuprates. Uh, this, this is their Fermi surface, very complicated. And the magnetism there is not at pi pi, it's at pi zero. But if you close your eyes and apply this, this, this very simple rule, that when you scatter by Q, you're going to change the sign of your wave function. Uh, you predict that this thing should have what's called S plus minus pairing. And just in the last month or so, there's been a number of beautiful experiments really uh, confirming this. So this, this picture is really, I think, seems to be a very sim simple minor picture. It gives you a general explanation of all these two-dimensional antiferromagnetic uh, correlated superconductors. All right, <laughs> questions so far? So that, okay, so this is all very, everything I've talked about mostly is, you know, textbook physics. Uh, maybe I skipped some of the fancy field theory stuff. Yeah? Why, why is ITC a mystery? Do you know <laughs> uh, Well, okay, so I could make some snide remarks, but you know, the, 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 the correct, <laughs> the, the right answer is that, so, Okay, this is a nice picture. This, and the analog of this picture has been successful in helium 3A. And was also, people were thinking about heavy fermions. People were talking about very similar pictures. Uh, but then, uh, you see, so many people said, well, if this is really true, uh, when near the point where the TC is the highest, you should go and do neutron scattering. You should see strong phi fluctuation. You should see the phi goes on having long correlation. Okay. Uh, but you don't, or at least in the initial experiment, you didn't see it. Uh, and, and so that's, that was really the, the biggest question mark about this theory. Well, where are these five fluctuations? If they're so important in giving us such a high TC, where are they gone? Why don't we see them? And since I have seven minutes left, that's the question. In fact, that's a great question. That's the question the remaining part of my talk was designed to answer. So one answer, of course, is that high magnetic fields. So one thing you can do is one answer, you know, you, the experiment then so far was done here. Okay. But now you want to get rid of superconductivity, which requires, uh, in YBCO, to get rid of superconductivity near optimal doping would require almost 100 Tesla field. Uh, so you've got to put in that much of field and then measure uh, the antiferromagnetism. But what has been done is, you know, measured indirectly. You see in the pockets, you see neutron scattering high fields. So when you suppress the superconductivity, 
This is only the results in the last three years. You're seeing the reemergence of antiferromagnetism. So that's telling you, well, the reason you didn't see it uh, was actually superconductivity has kind of obscured the picture. Uh, so the antiferromagnetism induces superconductivity, but once the superconductivity appears, it hides the antiferromagnetism. That's the content of the next five minutes of the transparency that I'm going to flash in front of you and all the experimental support for that picture. <laughs> Uh, but, but that's an excellent point. Okay. Uh, since I, let me just segue to that. So the, in fact, what did, let me just mention here uh, that near this critical point, no, so we started with spin density wave in the metal, we went near the critical point and we found superconductivity. Do you find anything else? Well, in fact, you do. Uh, this is a recent paper of ours just a couple of months ago. We found that the theory had some pseudo spin symmetry and it led to all kinds of density level ordering like this, which perhaps has something to do with these experiments in SDM, but okay. <laughs> but let me, quick, <laughs> uh, sorry, my time's up. <laughs> so now, let, let me tell you now, let me give you, you know, the world according to me, how does this all fit together into the real world of the cube rates. So far, I, I, you know, I can safely say I've just presented relatively boring and well-established theory, but you certainly need to know the basics, so that's what I'm focused on. <laughs> Uh, not worry. I mean, I think some of the stuff is really quite interesting. But how does this all fit together into an actual phase diagram like this? So, so here's my proposal. Uh, let's assume that this spin density wave order uh, that I've been talking so much about really is present in some hypothetical superconductor up to some large doping, up to XM. And XM is right here, where you have the highest DC, the optimal doping, or around there. Let's assume there is indeed, in some hypothetical state, a transition of the type I've discussed with strong antiferromagnetism. Okay. Now, in some of the cube rates with low TC, like the lens in the series, you see this very clearly. But then the counterattack to that is, well, why don't you see it in YBCO, which is the highest TC? I'll tell you why now. Uh, also, the nicta, you see this also. And the electron drop cube rates. Anyway, so let's start with this. Then I said, I just gave you an argument why near such a critical point, uh, superconductivity is going to kick in. There. OK, I got a superconductor. And I made it a dome shape. Don't ask me why. That, you can make arguments for that, too. <laughs> now you need one more effect. And this is going beyond the theories I've discussed so far. You need one more effect to complete the picture. The, the effect is that once the superconductivity kicks in, it like eats up all the Fermi surface. Uh, you get a gap all over the Fermi surface, except for those nodal points. And then the antiferromagnetism is not happy. So basically, the superconductivity, when it kicks in and becomes strong, it suppresses the antiferromagnetism. Uh, you know, so this, there's this competition effect, and the competition is for real estate on the Fermi surface. So once the superconductivity kicks in, the spin density wave point, which you thought was here, gets pushed to much lower dope. And at these lower dopings, around 12% you know, or so, uh, you do indeed see, well, not uh, one eighth doping, yeah, whatever, yeah, around 12% and lower. You do, do definitely see in all the cube rates strong antiferromagnetism, uh, but not near the optimal doping point. And the claim is that, well, really what you're seeing there is a remnant of the critical point in the metal that was moved by the onset of superconductivity. So you really have, you need a complete theory of two order parameters and how they move their respective critical points. Um, so this is something we've been working on for many years. And, and this, the, the SO5 theory of Zhang also had some connection to this physics. Uh, the competition between these two order parameters, the presence of one affects the other. Uh, okay. So now how do you test this picture? You test this picture by taking the phase diagram with the phantom critical point and the actual critical point, which appeared once superconductivity appeared, you test it by applying a magnetic field. And when you apply a field, you get rid of the superconductivity at high enough fields, and then the real critical point moves and is restored to its original phantom position where it really wanted to be. Okay, so this green line is the onset of antiferromagnetism in the superconducting phase. Uh, this is the onset of the normal state. So now, you see, if you start here, you have no antiferromagnetism. 
you apply a field, you lose spin density wave and superconductivity, no, sorry, you apply a field, you lose superconductivity at onset of spin density wave and you get the pockets. And these quantum oscillation experiments that I showed you are, are right here. Okay. So what we'd like to now see are experiments that explore this entire region of the phase diagram. Uh, there's, all, there's experiments down here as a function of field which really support all of this. You know, this basic topology was predicted by us many years ago. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, but many, there's many, many holes in this theory. You know, how do you describe, if there's no direct experimental evidence yet for antiparabagans at these high fields. Uh, how do you describe this region? And the proposal here is somehow this critical point is also controlling the strange metal. That's, of course, just, you know, just a proposal. And there's no real theory for that. So there are many interesting questions left. Uh, but the underlying actor in this picture, the two important things. One is the onset of spin density wave order in the superconductor, in, in the metal. And second, once the, spin, the spin, fluctuation of spin density wave order induced superconductivity, and then these multiple order parameters interact in a rather complicated way. Uh, you know, all these in, strong interactions are, these, these secondary effects here, this competition is a direct consequence of a large U. In weak coupling theory, these effects are relatively weak. Uh, and I'll just close by showing you. Sphere. Yes. So, so this uh, sphere does not explain, say, if I have a zero magnetic field. Yeah. Say, if I go up, say, at xm, yeah. then just go to the slightly uh, the outside the zone. Yeah. What do you see a large uh, uh, magnetic fluctuation? Large magnetic fluctuation? Yeah, not just been uh, density order. Yeah, just say. Uh, well, I mean, in, in a sense, so if you, let me see. You don't see it, and then it roughly explains that, you know. Yeah, but, that should, but that should still be controlled by XM, right, because that reason. Yeah, I mean, okay, so it's a question of, you know, how large a correlation that you need for the strange metal physics. So now, <laughs> right, so you're very far away from the actual critical point. That explains, and at high temperature, and that explains why you don't see strong antiferromagnetism there. Yeah, but there you should be controlled by XM, not XM. Well, but you okay, there's no way to think about it, but then you're at high temperature further to the XM. So as you increase the temperature, your spin correlation ends up falling off at the power of temperature. Yeah, but that has to be strong enough to induce this a very strong uh, uh, to induce this uh, a parameter. Well, okay, so there's a number of quantitative numbers there, but you know, okay, fine. So what I will say is that if you take the lower T C materials where you can suppress this this thing down to zero and then look at the actual XM, you do see and if you see the long spin, uh, spin and charge density wave correlation lines. Uh, but yeah, so in here, clearly, you know, we don't have a theory for what's going on here, but I claim the necessary ingredient should be the theory of the critical point XM plus the effect of fluctuating pairing, uh, the pairing fluctuation. That's somehow responsible for the strain metal. Uh, and I would say further, you know, I agree it's a big challenge to explain the strain metal at these high temperatures. But the strain metal behavior, once you suppress the superconductivity, goes all the way down to zero temperature. And I'm just trying to understand the low temperature limit where you see the strain metal at low temperature. And once we do that, I, I suspect that you'll also get a description of the higher temperature physics. Yeah. Uh, basic question. What are the two phases exactly are separated by XM in this picture? Uh, well, they're in the metal. It's just the phases that I discussed in this, this talk. Right, but before, once you, you're saying that the real critical point is moved over to XS, right? Right, so, so, so there's nothing there. So once, okay. so there's, there's, just, there's nothing there. There's nothing special. There's no, well, there could be these other pneumatic order parameters still surviving. Okay. You, you, the superconductivity gets rid of the anti magnetism, but it may not get rid of these pneumatic orders. But in this zero sort of picture, there's nothing there. It's gone. Okay. The, the only critical point is there okay. at, at, in, in zero magnetic field. So then these lines that move down and seem to yeah, so, so, there, so I would say there, you know, in this, uh, the actual line would actually do something like this. Okay. this, this the dotted lines are just for guide to the eye. These are roughly actual lines. So that's, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can I, I thought you can't really measure anything on the superconducting dome. Like, you know, it's just superconductor. You, otherwise, you would be able to measure all these dotted green lines. But oh, you do. Those are seen. Those are definitely seen in a variety of experiments. You see quantum criticality here with omega OT scaling and all of that. Under the superconductor? Absolutely. You can do neutron scattering in a superconductor. That's not a problem. So the, the, these, this thing is well studied and clearly seen. No question about it. Including starting with experiments at MIT by Bergenau and Keimer and others. 
So then the, uh, and then the young Lee, yeah. So, so then your new claim is that as you slowly start increasing H, you'll see where that happens moving over. And exactly, exactly. And so the support, I, so one, one, so one test of that claim, which was our prediction in our paper, but if you start it here and apply the field, you'll see the quantum criticality of finite field. And, and that was seen in a beautiful experiment by Yang Li. Uh, and there's two more experiments here which have seen the same thing uh, in both in LSCO and recently there's an experiment of Keimer uh, at 15 Tesla field in YBCO again seeing this, this, this line. So this line was one of our main predictions here. What hasn't been seen is this line in the highest TC material. So uh, here, let me just close by showing you two low TC materials. OK, cerium, rhodium, indium, five. Uh, OK, let me not. I'm out of time. But the basic point is that it has basically the same phase diagram. This is an experimental paper. And again, you see this. In fact, they measure this line of the spin density wave going down as you enter the superconductivity from PC to PC star. It's a very small shift there. And also, the Nick tides, you see this anti magnetism coming in, once you have the superconductivity, it goes backwards. Uh, the same effect, I'm just coming out in PRL, I think it's already out in PRL now. Uh, and so my basic point is that the physics is very similar in all of these materials. But the only difference, the real difference of this shift is, is large. It's much larger in the cubics, and that obscures the fact that, uh, you know, it makes, in the end, I think it makes at zero field, makes spin density wave fluctuations seem less important than they actually, they actually are. Okay, well, thank you very much. <laughs>